So big picture, we're trying to link uh, macroeconomics and finance. We saw how the standard power utility model had trouble, and you saw two of the many uh, utility changes in the utility function that have been used to try to fix those things, habits and uh, long run risks or, or recursive utility. Now let's go on and look at market structure. Maybe expanding on the market structure is going to be the key to help us uh, get macroeconomics and asset pricing linked up again. Here we'll look at a, a beautiful example by Constantinides and Duffy. And their idea was to track down idiosyncratic risk. After all, we've been looking at aggregate consumption. None of us, all of us have uh, our own peculiar risks. Maybe the fact that we have individual risks that aren't perfectly insured. That's the central thing wrong with the model and that fixing that will help us to, uh, to reconcile the model and the data. That's a very attractive idea. Uh, each of us does have a lot of idiosyncratic risk. If the central problem of the equity premium was that consumption growth wasn't volatile enough, well, individual consumption growth is much more volatile than 20%. But there's a puzzle. There's a puzzle. How can idiosyncratic shocks matter? Let me remind you of a simple piece of algebra we did long ago. E of MR is the same as the projection of M on X uh, plus residual times R is the same as the projection of M on X times R. That almost shows that idiosyncratic variation epsilon can't make any difference because it's the common component that matters for asset pricing. How do we escape that puzzle? Aha! Uh, utility is nonlinear. If we had idiosyncratic marginal utility, that can't make any difference whatsoever. But idiosyncratic consumption through a nonlinear utility function gives us an effect. So here's the bottom line of the Constantinides and Duffy model. The discount factor is, once again, consumption growth to, consumption growth to a minus gamma. We're still going to use power utility functions. We're just going to give people idiosyncratic risks. But then another term. Once again, we have another term multiplying the consumption growth term. Here it is uh, gamma, gamma plus 1 over 2, yt plus 1 squared, which is the cross-sectional variance of consumption growth. Here's the model. Individual I's consumption growth is aggregate consumption growth times an individual I shock multiplied by Y. And therefore, when Y is higher, the idiosyncratic variance is higher. It's a very attractive idea. Why are people scared in recessions? It's not really about aggregates. It's that in recessions, some people lose their jobs, other people don't. So it's this, it's this increase in cross-sectional risk, uh, not an increase in aggregate risk that causes people to be afraid of holding stocks in recessions. Who wants to hold stocks that fall exactly when you got fired? Now, this is such a simple model, we can actually go through the algebra in, in the lecture. Consumption growth, again, individual consumption growth is aggregate plus the individual shock, where y is the variable, a higher y gives us a higher volatility of the individual shock. Uh, our goal is to get from there to this discount factor, which is the variance of the individual shocks. How do we get there? Um, one equals, we start with the individual power utility first order condition. That's always there. Uh, and we're still using power utility. Substitute in the individual consumption growth in terms of the aggregate. So that's CIT in terms of the aggregate. The expected value at time t of something is ET of ET plus 1 of the same thing. So you know how to take the expectation of a log normal. That's why the minus 1 half was there, in order to cancel the minus 1 half that comes out when we take the expectation there. And then when, when you're done, you get the y term out. So it's the expected value of cons aggregate consumption of the gamma times the cross-sectional variance. That is, at a minimum, a brilliant existence or reverse engineering theorem. Uh, if you want any puzzle in asset pricing to work, you can get it to work by positing that the cross-sectional variance of consumption growth rises in such a way that's your new state variable. That's your new factor. Uh, that can explain any asset pricing model you want. Uh, whereas I thought going into it, not recognizing the long linearities, that idiosyncratic risk could do nothing at all. The question, of course, is, is this quantitatively true? That spawned a huge empirical literature. Is it true? Uh, that cross-sectional volatility, the idiosyncratic risk, is as large uh, as what we need. And remember, it's about consumption. It's not really about losing your job. It's the cross-sectional risk and how much do you eat less if you're the guy who loses your job uh, in a recession. Uh, I went through a little calculation here. 
Uh, m is, that's our discount factor. What we need, this is sigma of m in the hansen jagannathan bound. That's the thing that needs to be big to create a variance of the equity premium. So that's the, the variance of the thing that we need is the variance of the variance of consumption, the, the, the time series variation in the cross-sectional variation of consumption growth. So how much does the cross-sectional volatility of consumption growth vary? To get a, a, a risk aversion of one, uh, you need about that thing to be about 0.5. That's our usual 0.5. Well, that means that the cross-sectional standard deviation of consumption growth is about uh, 0.71. Uh, that's just huge, 71 percentage points. And that needs to be the variation, not just the level. So I'm not convinced that this, that this quantity, the cross-sectional variation of consumption growth, varies over time enough to account for the equity premium uh, and our puzzles, but that's an issue for the data. And so a first round of empirical work said it's there. People, recessions are cross-sectionally more riskier, not enough. You still need high risk aversion. A uh, new round of work in data is looking at rare disasters. Maybe the few people who really suffer in recessions account for this, this uh, cross-sectional variance of consumption growth. Let's leave that open. You, you can see the mechanism. It's a different mechanism. Aggregates uh, are alone. What people are scared about in recessions is this cross-sectional variance. Uh, the question for us is, is that cross-sectional variance, does it go up at the right times, and does it go up and down enough to account for our asset pricing puzzles? It's not changing the utility function, it's changing the market structure. Uh, it's changing the assumption implicit in our previous model that all risks are perfectly shared, which is surely not true. Uh, the question is, is that the key ingredient that matters for explaining the data?